Hello and welcome to another edition of Hoover's History. Today in the news we're going to go ahead and cover the Indian Removal Act. This is uh, going to be considered um, a very important stage in the removal, obviously, of the Native Americans. And this time it really kicks off with Thomas Jefferson and leaning into it. It doesn't really tell you that too much in, in, in a textbook. But we're going to look at, really, uh, Andrew Jackson is going to be the individual who's going to take this really to heart. And we're going to start off with that. But first, let's go ahead and summarize what's going on here. Um, first, we have the Louisiana Purchase, and that is during Thomas Jefferson's time. Then we're going to have the Treaty of Adams Onus, which is after uh, the War of 1812. That's going to happen. So that's at the end. So now we're taking a look at the Louisiana Purchase and this Adams Onus Treaty and what it really does is set things up for. So effectively, all this does is remove all the foreign and basically fragments on American territory and in the Northern America. Uh, this, is, this had uh, an accelerated result and of removing all of the protection in that region that the Native Americans would actually have. So they received from foreign powers, especially British. The British were always giving them ammunitions and weapons and really messing around with the United States of America an awful lot with settlements. Started out, you know, we talked about that with the Appalachian Mountains and you couldn't go basically west of the Appalachians. Now they're going to start looking at the Mississippi River as the next... Uh, border that they can't cross so they're going to draw that line in the sand so that's that's all gone so they're just going to be down to us so no notable Britain help and free to expand is what the United States is going to be able to do with its foreign policies throughout the 19th century worked basically to the advantage of the disadvantage excuse me disadvantage of the Native Americans so there's they're, they lost their allies and now they're just going to be facing the United States Let's take a look at the playing field here of the Native Americans who's involved with it. It's going to be the Cherokee, the Creeks, the, the um, Choctaw, and the Chickasaw. And then finally we have down in Florida, which is going to be the Seminoles. And those are lower creeks. So we're looking at five civilized tribes that we're going to be dealing with and removing them from their land and territories. Who basically these five... Um, we're looking at who whites refer to as the occupies sizable tracts of land in Tennessee. It's going to be Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and then finally Florida. We're looking at those areas that we're going to be uh, interested in. So portions of these tribes had actually accepted, out of the five, accepted the teachings of the white missionaries that we sent because we wanted to convert them to Christianity, which we did. And uh, we talked about this in your textbook also, which is going to be Chief Sequoia. He devised actually a written Cherokee language and published his own paper, which is called the, the Cherokee Phoenix, what he's going to be coming out with. So while they have a you know, significant number of Indians ceding, that means giving up their land, to the United States government, many actually did resist this, this removal. And we're going to go over that in here in just a minute. So uh, a significant number of Americans ceded their lands. And many of them were, were talking about what we just talked about there just a second ago. They were civilized Indians, which was going to be resisting, knowing that we had basically... Uh, that they depended on interactions with the, the whites for survival and you know, for trade and things like that. Others who had clung to their ancient customs, which they still struggle with and try to do even today, and uh, were reluctant to abandon their ancestral lands. Uh, land meant an awful lot to them, not just to hunt on, but uh, the Mother Earth. And they just couldn't quite get that concept that you can actually own land and possess it. It's more of a religious thing for them because uh, it gives them so much in their um, way of life. So let's go ahead and dive into Jackson here in 1830. So he comes up with the Indian Removal Act, which granted Jackson uh, the funds and the authority. We're going to go over the funds here in just a second. 
and the authority to remove the Indians by force if necessary. The Georgia legislature passes a resolution uh, stating that after 1830, the Indians could not actually be parties uh, to or witness in a court cases uh, involving whites. So it's segregation is what they're kicking on them. So these treaties signed in 1830 and 1832 have begun to remove uh, the following, which is the Chickasaws, and that's from Alabama. Choctaws, also from Alabama. And then in 1836, they're going to look at Georgia. And the Georgia militia gets involved with this one, attacking the Creeks uh, residing in that state. And in that year, they had 15,000 Creeks were removed and forced west of the Mississippi River. We talked about that line between 1835 and 1840. The federal government is going to spend $420 million on this war to basically eject the Seminoles uh, from Florida. So let's take a look at the legal side here, and this is going to be Worcester versus Georgia. And this is uh, the Cherokees attempted to legally uh, resist to, to this removal. The Cherokees did in 1827. Uh, they declared themselves an independent nation uh, from, from Georgia, but they are in Georgia, only to have Georgia leg legislator pass laws giving it jurisdiction over the nation. So we're going to have a battle here. So the Supreme Court ruled that the Cherokees were um, <clears throat> neither a nation or a state. However, there's always a however here, and this is where the Chief Justice uh, John Marshall gets involved. Chief Just Justice John Marshall ruled that the Cherokees were a domestic <clears throat> dependent nation. So, and they were hereby entitled to prote protection. And this decision carried on very minimal weight, and Jackson knew that. Andrew Jackson reportedly responded to this decision, it's a quote here, uh, by saying, okay, John Marshall, you, you basically made your decision. Now let's see if you can actually enforce it. So it's like throwing down a gauntlet. All right, we're, I'm going to actually eject them and remove them. Let's see if you can actually stop me. And so that's what he's going to get into. So between 1835 and 1838, we got bands of Cherokee Indians removed west of the Mississippi. Uh, who are going to be moved west of uh, to the Mississippi along the so-called Trail of Tears. And that's between 2,000 and 4,000 of the 16,000 uh, migrating Cherokees actually died on, on that trip. Um, and we're going to show you that in a minute here. I got a pretty good one at the beginning of that trail. <clears throat> uh, let's take a look at the Black Hawk Native Americans. These guys are going to be up in Illinois in that area. These are more of uh, Midwest, Northern so, Northwestern Indians, <coughs> and this is going to involve an individual that we know in history pretty well, and that's going to be Captain, yeah, I called him Captain, Abraham Lincoln, uh, because he's going to be pretty much elected uh, by the, you know, his peers to lead them in the militia and go up and actually fight in the Black Hawk Wars. He said in his own words, he got there too late, the only thing that he was fighting was mosquitoes by that time, but what went down is this, um, the Indians... These guys did give up basically a mild resistance on the removal, but met with a similar fate as, as the Cherokees did and the rest of them. Most notable among the resistance were basically, we talked about Black Hawk, uh, that was the chief, that's why I called the Black Hawk Wars, who mounted a significant resistance both in 1831 and 1832 in Illinois. So uh, in the end, federal troops crushed this rebellion and others between 1832 and 1837, the United States acquired nearly 190 million acres uh, of the Northwestern land in return for about $70 million in gifts. So that's what's going on. Um, and then we're going to hit on some, some other things. We're going to go a little deeper on, on these issues. So the United States had had basically taking these steps to remove the Native Americans and the Indians from the borders in the western states by beginning of the very, you know, 19th century. So the very, in the, in the extreme early 1800s, the Indian population at, at large had dwindled down. Now we're talking about diseases, 
and other things that that took place but constant warfare either between themselves or between the settlements as well settlers and uh but so by the beginning of this the population is going to be dwindling so that's going to leave them a little bit vulnerable and somebody's going to pick up on that uh, the only indians remaining inside the borders of the united states um lived in tight communities very much separated from the white society who could blame them despite the effort of some of them actually to integrate like we told you um the, the life of the white americans and that was through christianity and other ways even the way they dressed talked newspapers so the indians experienced fairly uh, this consistent antagonism okay they're just getting prodded 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 so they're getting antagonized uh, uh, basically at the hands of white settlers uh, but this was not until after the War of 1812 um, that the federal government actually took a, um, a very fierce stance on this removal. So we can concentrate and focus on them now so we don't have to focus with the British or the French. So we have the Louisiana Purchase during Jefferson's uh, uh, run in office there as time and a moderate success in, in the War of 1812. Again, we're going to go a little bit deeper than that. Um, had removed the British, which were proponents of the Native Americans, their primary advocates, from the American West. And it sparked a new American nationalism, this, this, this did, with, uh, with, with this Louisiana Purchase, which centered on the desire to expand. Because that's going to come back to what we call Manifest Destiny. It's going to really kick that off. So the Indians were seen as an obstacle. They're in the way. So during Manifest Destiny, that's not going to be an option because it's coast to coast, and if you're in the way, you're going to be you're going to be out uh, for our homelands throughout. They're an obstacle throughout the nation's territory uh, into a small, cons you know, cons basically concentrated area of Indian reservations on what we now know as as Oklahoma and Kansas. So they go from a fertile soil and territory and lands on the eastern coast and we just shove them on a basically a less fertile soil we think it's not going to be worth anything um, so that, that's not going to last for long we're going to move them away from that as well so again we have Andrew Jackson who embodied the Americans bought him basically embodied the Americans new mil basically militancy towards the tribe so he has this basically hatred towards him. Uh, so he realized that by the 1820s, like they're going to be getting weak, so the balance of the power between the American settlers had shifted from the early years. Uh, the whites had grown stronger, and uh, the Indians having, you know, lost foreign support, and we talked about that, grew weaker, and Jackson personally had led, he led troops against the Creeks, and very victorious at Horseshoe Bend in 1814. And basically, this convinced Jackson uh, that the Indians were much weaker than, than many had actually assumed. And that they should basically crumble, crumble pretty quick, quickly under an advanced Western you know, expansion. So he decided... Um, let's see, the practice of negotiation of these treaties in favor of uh, coercive measures, his policies reflected both his disdain and racism towards the uh, Native Americans and, and with his somewhat less victorious you know, conviction that in the East and also the full-blooded Indians would be exploited by the uh, we call the whites as well as the self-serving um, mixed bloods that we talked about with the Native Americans. So nowhere was Jackson um, more committed to this uh, removal more strongly than we talked about the demonstration in his in his reaction to the ruling of the Worcester versus Georgia. Okay, this is that le legalities that we're going to get with the with the Cherokee Nation. He not only showed his his unflinching you know support for the Cherokee removal, but also he demonstrated 
uh, the growth of power of his presidency. He's got to do that. He's going to take a really, you know, a real strong and powerful uh, stance on this, clearly def defying the uh, will of the Supreme Court without even a uh, major consequence. He just told John Marshall, you know, let's go ahead and force it and see what you can do. So the case of the Cherokee Nation uh, is itself a demonstration uh, of the struggle of the, of the Native Americans in the 1820s. And in efforts to consolidate their their collective identity into um, their ancestral lands, and so you know both of these both of these are slipping away, as the whites are actually increasingly uh, uh, interacting uh, with uh, with the tribes uh, with with this in intenseness and, and you know rejecting them out. So the Cherokees founded a nation in hopes of maintaining, you know, legally uh, their culture and their land. In response, though, we have the federal government denied the tribe um, the strength that was provided for basically to have a, a, a nation. And uh, in a sign of complete disrespect to the, to the Native Americans, uh, you know, there is a trickery kind of in force that is that has expelled the Indians to to serve the, the greedy desires of the of the United States and the settlers and the government and, and actually that, that actually backed them when they were taking this land away from them. So um, armed with a new sense of, of national destiny, which is that manifest destiny and federal government. Uh, took what it was actually uh, the beginning to believe um, was rightfully its own, which is which it wasn't, with little if none, no regard whatsoever to the consequences from the the previous inhabitants, which would be the Native Americans. So I always tell my kids, you know, I I um, I love my country. You know, I serve my country. I love my country. But I'm not always proud of what she's done. And you know, I tell them it's just like a, a parent also. So my parents, they, they love me. I, I know that. They love me unconditionally because I did things that were, that were not, you know, very um, proud of. So they can overlook that and, and say, hey, yeah, we, we, we love you. So that's the unconditional. So uh, that's the way I take a look at it. So I, I love my, you know, country, I, I guess, like my parents love me. So, you know, they love me, but I also had some, uh, some obviously some, some times to where it was not um, always proud. So that's, that's just going to go ahead and key on that, and we're going to stop there. So that, that's, that's basically going to be the Indian removals, and we went over the acts. And, and how bad this really got. So, hope that helps out. And that's going to be Chapter uh, 10, Section 4, the Indian Rule Act. And it's been a pleasure sharing uh, my history and thoughts with you. And I hope you had a good time as well. And have a great day. In the 1830s, U.S. Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. Troops were sent to run up the five civilized tribes, which were the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, and the Seminoles, and forced them to leave their ancestral homelands in the South and walk to Indian territory, which was Oklahoma. Many died from the hardship which became known as the Trail of Tears. <laughs>